Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is John Seminatore. John is an Air Force veteran and a senior staff technical program manager at Latitude AI, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Ford Motor Company. John, welcome to the pod. Thanks a lot, Spencer. Thanks for having me here. Appreciate you coming on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, good to be here. Good to be here. Been a long time coming. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I've been excited for this for a while. Um, Got introduced by our mutual friend, Brian Beyer. Uh, great dude. Oh, yeah. Brian's the best. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's awesome. Yeah, he said you'd be a good get for the podcast. And uh, I don't know. I've just been enjoying getting to know you in general. Like, uh, you're, you're good people all around. And, and some of the stories you told me, like, the last time we hung out, I was like, yeah, this guy's definitely going to be a good get for the podcast. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll try to live up to the expectations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks, Spencer. Yeah, no worries, John. So I guess two directions we could go. So the first one is... What does a technical program manager do exactly? Because, I mean, there's, it seems like it means a lot of different things at different organizations, to steal your words from before. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, um, I think a lot of people think of program managers without the technical bit as these guys who maintain schedules, right? You have your scrum board and you're moving stories around and you got tickets and all that. Um, but the technical aspect, I think, is a really important component of what I do. So my background is in aerospace engineering and robotics, right? And so I know the systems I'm working, and my responsibility is a lot more than managing a schedule, right? A lot of what I do is making sure that people are talking to each other, making sure that people can interface properly, making sure that people actually... Um, aren't doing the same thing multiple times. So a great example we always go to is at one point when I was at Argo, we had six different versions of a circular ring buffer for, for the memory of, you know, how, how do you actually access the memory? There were six different ways you could do it. And I was like, well, we probably only need one, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we should pick the best one and, you know, let's, let's everyone convert to that. And, you know, right. Um, so it's finding a lot of things where it's like, Hey, you're doing, you're doing what that guy's doing. Why don't you guys collaborate? And why don't we try to try to minimize the, uh, the, the duplication of effort. That's cool. So it sounds like there's maybe some overlap with like systems engineering a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I was actually a systems engineer in, at uh, at Carnegie Robotics, right? Um, there's there's a lot of overlap with the position. It's a little bit different in that systems engineering is usually focused around uh, the product requirements, right? What do we actually need to do to make the product succeed? Uh, whereas the technical program manager, we're much more make the product a reality, make it actually execute. But we serve as an interface between your product team that's kind of working with the customer, what do you actually want to deliver, your systems team that's writing the requirements for the engineers, this is how we know we've succeeded, and then the technical program manager makes it all come together on schedule. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. You get access to so much of the system, you really get to see what's going on, and you have a great bird's eye view. and uh, and. You learn a lot. Like, I have no background in software development, none whatsoever. I'm a mechanical guy, control systems, but uh, here I am working with machine learning and overseeing a lot of software teams and software development and, you yeah. know, well, don't have to like write code. The, the buffer you mentioned, it was a data structure too. So, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So, so you know, um, if you ask me how to actually write that, I have no idea. I, <laughs> like, I can code a little bit of MATLAB, a little bit of Python, but like I have no idea how C++ works or CUDA or TensorRT or any of that stuff you use for machine learning training. But setting up the system, what's required to get the data from the system, things like that, that's, that's, that's kind of my bread and butter of like, okay, how do we make this actually work? How do we build it? How do we turn it into a product? That's awesome. So what are some of the projects you kind of cut your teeth on like early on in your career that made you want to go that direction? Um, I was always interested in robotics, but I kind of got sidetracked in college into the aerospace world, and uh, that led to my time in the Air Force. So a lot of what I did in the Air Force, my first assignment was in a uh, research and development group. Um, oh, cool. 
and we actually did the first SpaceX launch, uh, SMC XR. We were responsible for the first launch of SpaceX. That would have been like the single um, engine rocket that they had on that island. Yep, on Kwajalein, blew up three times. <laughs> <laughs> nice. uh, yeah, That's yeah. That's what you want. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, uh, I remember very distinctly we were watching that first launch and, uh, you know, we were in the conference room and the engine lit up with like, you know, five seconds left in the countdown. And then with one second left, they like turned it off and something went wrong. We're like, are they going to try again? Right. It's supposed to be reusable. Right. Like light that candle again if they fix it. And they did. And, you know, kudos to them for trying that, um, you know, uh, at the time. Right. The idea of reusing a rocket engine without massive amounts of tests and like verifying that it was you know, still up to snuff and everything, the Air Force didn't do that. But the oh, beauty of cool. the project and what we did in my organization was, no, we're specifically supposed to take those chances and push that technology to where it needs to go. Yeah, and if it's that isolated, I mean, what's the harm in doing that? Yeah, yeah, Kwajalein is uh, an interesting place. We uh, we tend to, uh, it's, it's, it's where uh, when we test uh, that our ICBMs still function, it's where we test that they the warheads still hit on target <laughs> oh that's interesting yeah they're they're inactive warheads everyone always asks we we detonate nuclear bombs no they're that's just you know the guidance system that's all we're testing oh that's cool <laughs> yeah that sounds like a lot of fun to be honest um so it, it Carnegie, then, you got to work on the Nilfisk scrubber. Um. Yeah, yeah. So after I left the Air Force, I went to grad school and uh, ended up over at Carnegie Robotics. Uh, and I was the program manager for, for the Nilfisk SC-50 scrubber, uh, which is a great little system. It's one of the first, I think, slam-capable, mass-produced commercial products out there. Um, and so super proud of it. It's, it's one of the only things in my career that I can actually go somewhere and see it in operation. We've got four of them here at the Pittsburgh airport uh, nice. that you can see uh, cleaning, cleaning the airport. And I think the Penguins have some at the stadium. So That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It was a really cool project. I feel like it wouldn't be a far cry to put that on the Zamboni. <clears throat> you know, I actually talked to Brian Beyer about doing the Zamboni project, and he <laughs> said they had tried it, but someone had sn snuck in and uh, taken it from them, and so they were just waiting for, for them to come to their senses and come back to Carnegie. So. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so you guys got outbid. <clears throat> yeah, I guess so. I mean, it was before I joined the project. I took over for a uh, previous program manager, so I, I took over about halfway, eh, three-quarters of the way through the project. Yeah, that makes sense. Been there. I mean, for, I guess, a competitive product, uh, Discover Robotics, I think I can talk about this now because they no longer exist. We we bid them for some work on, on some of their software systems, and we got underbid by an offshore company <coughs> by quite a big amount. And last I checked in, they overran our budget. And <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we bid honestly. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, uh, you know. They do. It's always it's always a challenge with these R and D projects, right? Like um, you know that that project, especially uh, when I took it over, it was a firm fixed price project. Which when you're doing R and D, man, that's that's a rough one. Yeah, it's, that's scary. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you come out on top with those, but I mean, my experience has been for R and D. Like I always want to go T N M these days, just because I've been burned too many times on firm fixed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think the real challenge in that situation, and what made it uh, kind of a unique project, um, is the customer is uh, Nilfisk has been a lot around for a long time, like 120 years. Uh, they're known as Advance, I guess, in the U S. But they're a Danish company, and. Um, you know, this was really kind of pushing the envelope for them, right? Like they knew how to make cleaning products and that's what they did. Um, and so we leveraged that, that, that experience, right? What did we know about making cleaning products? We knew how to build robots at Carnegie, um, but they weren't really used to like, oh, there's, there's unpredictability here, right? Like an engine is an engine, right? The, I think at the time we were working on the project, the most advanced software they had on any of their system was 6,000 lines of code. <laughs> and we were in the like millions, right? Yeah, like, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so you know, it was a real adjustment to them, um, and uh, and you know, I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, at one point, right, kind of the 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 senior manager. So I had my counterpart at Nilfisk, and his new boss came from Denmark to kind of oversee the project and what we're doing and everything. And you know, I wanted to sit down with the guy and give him a good impression of what's going on and all that. And I was like, you know. Uh, I really want to commend you on Nilfix's forward-thinking vision, right? Because at the time, right, like, no one really mass-produced robots, right? Like, okay, you had, like, iRobot that's making your little home Roombas, 
and they'd make like the talons and like the military robots but you know how many of those do they make a year right like you're making a couple hundred of the talons yeah of the talons yeah i robot yeah sure sure but you're we're talking a different scale right like uh, anyone who's thinking i'm talking about like a little roomba thing no this this thing weighs 1500 pounds and like cleans warehouses (laughs) right um and so you know i'm talking to the to the manager and i'm like you know at this point next year when we release the product Nilfisk will be one of the largest manufacturers of autonomous robots in the world. And, like, he was like, huh. And I was like, okay, well, he took that kind of weird. All right. (laughs) I don't know what happened, right? And then, uh, you know, I'm off doing some work, and my counterpart comes over. He's like, what did you say to him? And I'm like, well, no, I said, you know, Nilfisk, great. You're being this forward-thinking, amazing company. And he was like, well, he thinks this is some sort of R&D project. It's like... Well, I mean, it is, right? <laughs> I mean, do you see cleaning robots? You know, uh, the system's really advanced. It uses full slam. Like, you know, you, you, you tell it where it is and, like, you know, um, it, it remembers the map. It'll duplicate exactly what you did every time or it can auto fill in what you're doing. And, like, people underestimate, right, like how how much is still left in these systems, right? Like, it was nothing wrong with what he was saying. It just... Everyone thinks, oh, robots are right around the corner, right? Like yeah, yeah. Uh, artificial intelligence, thread right around the corner. We've got all these amazing things. Look at our phones. Chat GPT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chat GPT. It. It'll solve all <laughs> your problems, right? Like, <laughs> um, but like, there's a reason these things are university experiments or like startups, right? Like, this isn't getting a commercial robotic product. How many of those exist even today? You know, we're we're seven years since I worked on that. Something like that. Six years, right? Yeah. How many commercial products that have autonomy and, and, and slam and, like, advanced artificial intelligence really exist? Arguably, like, the John Deere tractors, the Tesla cars, yeah. to some extent. Uh, yeah, yeah. Some of their competitors well, now. Well, I mean, iRobot now has it, right? They got the upwards-facing camera on the Roomba, and it'll map your ceiling and stuff like that. Like, yeah. it exists. It is starting to get there. But like, is that how they're doing it? Is they have an upwards-facing camera? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got a little, they've got a little camera that looks up and it makes a map of your ceiling. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, if you move your table around, it'll mess with it a bunch. Um, <laughs> I don't know. They may have, they may, you know, I, I don't know their software, but I know they have the camera. They may be using their little uh, wall followers to do like a two D. 2D point cloud map Well, they've been or doing Slam for a while now with that, too. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you know, this was all kind of coming into play at yeah. around the same time. And I think that's that's one of the things, you know, with, with a lot of these technologies. Everyone starts to commercialize it at the same time. But um, but it's a process, and it's, it's work. It's not, like, taking something from a really cool demo that, like... You know, the DARPA, the DARPA Grand Challenge, right? That was in 2004. They had cars driving across the desert and in, on roads for hundreds of 50 miles and all that. Well, where are driverless cars today? They are far more advanced, way more advanced. They can do a heck of a lot more. But the real challenge is in building the commercial product, yeah. right? I can, do a, I can do a demo that's, hey, if I do it perfect, it'll be great. But doing something that, like, is repeatable and that my mom can use, that's a real challenge. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. And so, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been an interesting career. And, it, you know, the, 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 the work there is one of, one of the ones I'm really proud of. Because, like I said, it's, it's something I can actually point to and be like, yeah, I helped make that. Yeah, that's really awesome. Were there any, um, I don't know, just any interesting, like, moments in developing that that come to mind? Um, so I think one of the real challenges during the development was repurposing uh, sensors for, for situations that they weren't designed for. So one of the real challenges is scaling. And, and this is something I've learned in my career, right? So you're a grad student. You know, when I was doing the humanoid challenge, the DARPA grant, uh, Urb, uh, DRC. That'd be Thorin Escher. Thorin Escher at Virginia Tech. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm building one. Right, <laughs> and so okay, it's got you know twenty six motors or whatever. And but if you like, break that one, you're screwed. Oh you yeah, man, <laughs> man. Let me tell you, we we had one guy criticizing us at one point, like, oh, none of these teams are taking a risk and letting their robot fall. It's like, yeah, the robot falls and breaks. None of us graduate. Like, <laughs> like I'm sorry. <laughs> like, like, yeah, we're we're not gonna t- you know intentionally be dropping the robot. Um, it did fall. We did repair it, but uh, but um, 
but I'm you sure know you all lost sleep when that happened oh yo man that was that was terrifying you know and of course we made you know one of those famous robot fails videos um the lab nice. i think always seemed to end up in in those famous robot fail videos but. i crashed a robot through a wall at carnegie mellon when i was an undergrad whoa well there you go <laughs> see i've never i've never oh no that's not true i broke a wall at carnegie with with the scrubber once <laughs> but it wasn't autonomous it was me driving it nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think mine was also me driving it, but there was a lag. There was like a um a deceleration curve and it was set not aggressively enough, so I tried to stop and it stopped like a foot into the wall. Yeah, yeah, the challenge with these floor scrubbers is they've got these super soft tires so that they don't scuff the floor that they're cleaning, but man, that means you got like zero traction, especially cuz <laughs> you got a wet floor that you just so they uh they they do not handle well, and so uh, you know they would. They weigh a lot. They're carrying a ton Can of you water. Drift them? You, I, I, <laughs> I definitely. They do not stop on a dime. I got to. I got to drive one of the really big yes. ones. Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, that was a that was a good like twenty foot stopping distance on that guy. So yeah, that's wild. So you have to probably account for that in the autonomy. I mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, it, autonomous systems. One of the one of the things I get asked, like, how do I get into it? And I always say, well, you know, your your Lego Mindstorm, your first robotic, you know, competitions, it's all the same components. Just you're increasing the scale of, of, of the sensors and the quality of the sensors, right? So, you know, you got to know where you are. Then you got to know, right, what's going on around you, how the machine moves, right, and how to actually drive it and design the, the control system so that it follows the path you want. And so there's a bunch of different ways to do it, but, but you know, uh, what is it? Uh, see, think, act, right? Like, in the yeah. end, it boils down to see, think, act. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, you know, as you scale these things, one of the interesting things that starts to happen is, you know, you're a grad student, you're in a, you're, you're in a famous competition, you'll get sponsors who will give you some free stuff, right? Like, we were, we were sponsored by a couple of sensor companies or actuators or motor companies. And Can like, I ask, like, who you got sponsored uh, by? Yeah, we were sponsored by Maxon Motors. Oh, cool. um, and good stuff. Yeah, they make fantastic motors. And uh, THK, if you need ball screws, beautiful. Beautiful nice. ball screws, um, and uh, so you know they donated a lot to the to the university. Um, but then you know we go to Carnegie, and I'm like, oh well, you know, all right, we're we're talking like thousands, right? Uh, I'm building one now. I'm building thousands. I'm gonna get all sorts of price discounts. It's like, well, not really. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, you know, we, we we ended up using these kind of like little uh, laser distance sensors for for the cliff sensors to detect if you're you're on an edge and everything that are used in kind of like um, warehouse packaging lines to detect the packages going through and everything, and like. You know, people buy these and they buy ten thousand of them, and you oh, know, so you, that's you know, so priced. right, right. So like, we're not, we're not quite that level, or or like, we're buying an automotive sensor, or like, you know, the sick lidars at the time were were kind of like the big lidars, but like, we're not buying the volume that people want. Or or one of the things we did is uh, we were looking into ultrasonic sensors, and we're like, oh well, you know, cars have these great ultrasonic sensors. How expensive can it be? Well, yeah, the Ford's buying. 20 million of them a year right because <laughs> every f-150 they sell has eight of them right yeah. um so it was kind of the all right we've hit a certain level of scale in terms of that but there's a bigger fish and you know you got to really understand who your supplier is and like where 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 you become worth the support that they're going to give you well that's interesting so what are some of the ways that you kind of navigated around that? Did you have to go to alternate vendors? Did you have to kind of do a lot of the engineering yourself that normally the supplier application engineer would help with? Yeah, exactly. So a lot of it was like, you know, we're repurposing sensors for either situations they might not have originally been designed for. Um, so, you know, all of a sudden I have something that is safety certified and safety dependent, right? Like this cliff sensor, it's designed for detecting packages moving along an assembly line, right? Well, 
if this if this 1500 pound robot drives off a cliff right it'll kill someone yeah so how do you take a sensor at that's the very least break itself catastrophic right right very, or, or very expensive or uh at the time one of the things that was happening uh what was it that that company night um i don't night know if scope. you remember night scope yeah, yeah yeah they had the the famous like the little robot in the Carl, pool edit that picture in it's a great one <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 the little robot in the pool like that just like woo because i was like that is not what we do not want to go viral because of that right yeah. like we're like our floor scrubber even if it was it was designed mechanically so that it actually couldn't tip over a cliff it would like stop itself oh that's interesting right like how did you, you do that uh you have the little like cleaning pad and like the weight is just behind the cleaning pad so it'll just wedge itself and just i mean it's scary right it would be teetering on the edge yeah. but like the visual's still terrible right like it's the last thing you want right like you know robot goes crazy at mall <laughs> yeah did you see the one of the Chinese robot that like fell down the escalator and bowled a person over? Oh gosh, <laughs> it's I amazing! Mean, so this thing goes down an escalator, and there's like a person at the bottom, and they just get knocked. Yeah, yeah, like, right on their ass. As yeah. this robot goes underneath them. Well, and 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 so like you know, part of part of again, Nilfisk did a great job, really brilliant. One of the things they did is there is a um, IEC standard for floor scrubbers. Right, safety of floor scrubbers. Well, they worked and they created a working group, and I was a member of the working group to build an addendum for autonomous floor oh, cool. scrubbers. And so we developed the safety standard and how you do safety tests and how do you safety certify this floor scrubber. And again, part of it was, well, I'm using parts that like, it's not a safety rated part. How do I add the like redundancies and everything you need to reach the uh, safety integrity level of uh, I believe we went to SIL 2, SIL 3. I don't remember what, which level uh, we certified it to. I'm sure it's on their website. Sure. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, right, so, so first off, you know, you're in a new environment. You're kind of educating these people who don't know much about robotics of how we're building a safety system. And then you've got to understand how you're taking your system and you're, you're making it safe. And then you work with the vendor as much as you can, but at a certain point, You've got to, you've got to, you've got to kind of do it yourself, and that's that's risky. Is that like a lot of testing? Is it just systems engineering <clears throat> improving out, you know, certain paths? Or it's a little bit of both, right? So one of the big problems we had with the cliff sensors was actually black floors. So uh, one of the key places that they wanted to test this thing was this mall in Switzerland that had these beautiful black marble <laughs> floors. Nice. Um, and so anyone who has worked with lidar or lasers will tell you the worst possible thing to image is reflective black surfaces because yep. the black is going to absorb all your laser light and then the reflection will just scatter what's left everywhere and you get no returns on it. <laughs> uh, so we had to find, right, like something powerful enough that you would get a return off these black shiny floors. Does it still have to be human eye safe though at that and, point? Yeah, it has yeah. to be human eye safe and like, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it, it was a real challenge. And so, um, you know, me and uh, me and my uh, my my direct report, my partner in crime, she she had a background in photography. I had done some background. I have a bit of a background in theater, and I knew like the different shades of black. And so, what we did is we literally went out to like Michaels and bought just tons of different black cloths, black paints, and we rigged up like a little light detector kit, and we just measured each of them till we found the least reflective thing we could find and then that was our target right and that's nice. you know that's that's how we're gonna find the sensor and then we'd get some samples and like all right let's see what we can do and we'd call up the vendor and hey i need like your best laser and eventually we found a guy and you know he was like yeah this sucker i've never seen it fail and like it still worked, but like we were pushing the envelope. He's like, "Oh wow, <laughs> like, that's amazing!" You, you almost got me. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. So, so you know, it was it was a real experience, right? Like a little bit of a, 
you know, and, and this is where the T and the TPM to go back to what we were originally talking about, right? Like I was getting my hands dirty. It was too small a project for me to not be involved. So I'd repair the robot. I did a lot of the testing, right? Like I was physically going out and finding the materials and stuff like that. Um, yeah. And part of that is because I have a background in robotics. I understand what we need to do, how the sensors work. The software developers, all right, they're making the system and everything. I'm finding what we need to actually keep the project going. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. That's awesome, too. I mean, just being able to go out and find, like, every type of black to try to... Vanta black did not exist at the time. That would have really screwed us, I think. Vanta black? <laughs> oh, the blackest paint alive. What right? is like, that? It, it, is, it is a paint. I believe uh, it's, like, some lab in England or something. It is the darkest paint ever made. Interesting. What it... It has, not, like, carbon so nanotubes in it or something. <laughs> That's wild. Why did they come up with that? Just like to paint pianos darker? Uh, I believe, well, it's it's got a lot of applications in space, oh, okay. right? So like, um, you know, one of the things you do in space because you can't uh, radiate heat through an atmosphere, you only have like actual reflection. Well, I guess it is radiative, but you don't have the, the um, atmosphere to help propagate it, right? So what you do is you have these louvers that are like black and then they'll slide open and reveal the huh. white paint. And so the white paint will reflect all the sunlight off when you're too hot and you want to reject it. You slide it open to reflect. That's really interesting. And then you slide it to black when you want to absorb the sunlight. That's really interesting. Yeah. So you can just by changing the color. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. So, uh, so I think it was developed for that. Yeah. That's really cool. I, I really want to work on space stuff. I still haven't had a chance to do that yet. It is it is wild. Um, you know, uh, the satellites I put up uh, were, were incredible and yet archaic. Go on. <laughs> you know, so you... <laughs> well, I can't talk too much about them, okay. unfortunately. Uh, gotcha, but, gotcha. but, but uh, you know, the, the problem is how do you space certify... So we had an FPGA, which like, you know, a field programmable gate array and all that. How do you safety certify, space certify a FPGA? Because you're worried about the radiation like triggering bits yeah. and whatever. Well, what you do is you basically cut the capacity in four. Oh, and then you have four sectors, each one with like what what whatever your program is and that way if like radiation flips the bit on one of them the other ones are still kind of parallel pathing that's it that's wild so you're just limited because you're <coughs> going to be rad hardened right the, right and, and and then you yeah. have to have a really old processor right so like you can't How do you have vote on four though like what if you get a tie well you do three you oh, don't okay. actually the, you've got one spare in case one section just totally and then you can activate another right one. That's exactly cool. um but like you know you can't have your super tight like three nanometer chips in space because the radiation will be flipping bits all over the place right so you know uh, at the time we're using like Pentiums when it's like you know 2008 or whatever like <laughs> original paint Pentiums from That's 96 awesome. or so like you've got this kind of archaic technology but then you got some like really cool like um, some of the maneuvering was done purely by uh, they were called torque rods so you have your, huh. your you have your gyros that like spin the spacecraft. Right. That's for stabilization. For stabilization yeah. and orientation. But the problem with the gyro is eventually you hit like the max speed and you can't you can't like add any more uh, inertia to the to the wheel. Yeah. So what you do is you have these electromagnets on uh, on like the three corners, you know, the three cardinal directions of the uh, spacecraft. Yeah. And then you fire them. When you say the three cardinal directions. You mean X, X, Y, y and Z. Z. Yeah, yeah. Okay. On that axis, and what you do is you fire those those rods and you use the magnetic field of the earth to torque you and at the same time you huh. you you spin down your your gyro so that you can uh so that you can dump the momentum that's wild yeah it's super cool right <laughs> <laughs> like, i feel like we should put an illustration of that like in here where, where we talk about this if you can find a good one yeah 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 i mean uh yeah. it, it's a really cool system like it's it's yeah. super clever like there's no moving parts you got unlimited energy from the solar panels right like um so so it's it's a really cool industry space but that's uh, wild yeah now i remember like uh, i don't know if i should get into that but yeah yeah it's definitely interesting some of the things i've seen being space <coughs> adjacent so, I mean, I, I was an intern at SpaceX. I've worked in factories that made components for rocket engines. I just, 
I feel like I'm a pretender because I've never directly engineered something like myself to go into space. Ah, the, I, I've never been an actual engineer in my entire career. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you, you know, you know, the Air Force, the Air Force just kind of dumped me into program management right away, and yeah. like so, uh, so you know, grad school is probably the closest I got. So, yeah, what are some of the things you got to work on on the humanoid robots? Uh, the humanoids were really cool. Um, so, you know, at the time, obviously, Boston Dynamics was was the, I mean, they continue to be the, the, the bad boy on the street, you know, the, yeah. the most advanced. But um, we, we, the lab I worked in got uh, pretty famous because of uh, the RoboCup, the, the World Cup of Robots. Uh, and, and we had won. Like the soccer thing? Yeah, yeah, the soccer okay, cool. thing, the little soccer playing robots. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, the little baby ones, they were called the Darwins. Uh, those were originally developed in the lab. And then we had... Those a, were humanoid too, if I'm Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correctly. Little baby humanoids. Yeah. They had like big, big eyes and cat ears. That's interesting. But they weren't all humanoid. Like some of the other teams had wheeled robots. <coughs> there's right? different There's different categories oh, of got RoboCup. It. So there was, so, so, so there was the, the small actually. humanoid class. And then we yeah. had the full-size humanoid class where we had the robot Charlie. And then from there... Uh, we were How do you have a full-size humanoid team of robots? Oh, it was one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, At the time, it was sense. basically <laughs> penalty shots. Yeah, that's that's what I would think, just because the, I mean, it, so expensive to build a humanoid. Even right. Now and well, and that was one of the things. Like, Charlie, people would look at Charlie compared to the Boston Dynamics robots. We're like, Boston Dynamics has millions of dollars of defense funding. Meanwhile, we're a grad lab where we're using these uh, robotist servos, yeah. uh, where, like, they're good, but, like... They're servos, and they're 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 not like meant for That's like extended like a Dynamixel or something. Yeah, no, yeah. exactly the Dynamixels. Those yeah. are those are made by Robotus. Oh, we, we, we we <laughs> we uh, my friend my friend Jack tested like every single Dynamixel product they made yeah. between who, like who hasn't used those in grad school? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but you know, for the they, money they're amazing. They're I mean, amazing, but they wear out, right? They're yeah. you know, um, but yeah, Charlie was super cheap, but it's not going to have the capability of you know, um, Atlas. Atlas at the time. Um, so we moved on, and part of what we did was we designed our own actuators. We, we used series elastic actuators um, and, uh, and, and built the first humanoid to really use linear actuators for locomotion. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, that was the big thing. Uh, you know, we, 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 we developed a, our own walking algorithm. We had some immensely talented folks. Um, you can see some of their work. If you saw the video of Disney built Baby Groot. Um, oh, I did see that. Yeah, yeah as that's... soon as I saw it walking, I was like, Robert and Mike worked on that. Turned out they did. How it did was, you know? It was our walk. It was uh, our algorithm. The like, gate. The gate. I was just like, that's our robot. That's Robert and Mike. I know they did it. That's inter Did they try to make the gate more Groot-like? Or was it... No, you no. couldn't really... Yeah, with it, yeah, it's like yeah. It's, it's I mean, I think like when work. it was dancing and everything, you know, that was that yeah. was someone else. But like just the walking gait and you know the algorithm, I was like, that is absolutely Robert and Mike. It's crazy that you could recognize it just. From, I mean, I guess I I do that too though. Like, there's certain like design elements of hardware that I I can zero in on and be like, oh, I know who worked on that. Or yeah, like I mean, if you look at the cameras on the Boss Dynamics Spot, it's obvious that they're reskin real senses just from the sensor element placement so yeah. i guess it's probably similar to that where you sort of see the artist's signature yeah yeah and and you know yeah. it was close enough to to when we were at grad school together that i was like oh yeah absolutely it's it's just the next generation version of what we were doing right so that's cool yeah it was pretty cool they probably were using dynamixels for something like that I imagine. <laughs> oh come on man that's disney imagineering they probably had custom machine whatever you think oh yeah i'm certain i i feel like all these all these entertainment folks use like inexpensive components, but I guess you're right. It's Disney. They've got all sorts of money. So I will never forget when I when I lived out in L.A. I, I volunteered as a first robotics mentor, and the, I did uh, that too. <laughs> yeah, and uh, the Imagineering team would they would sponsor the Imagineers would sponsor a team, and man, that robot was always just. Gorgeous. <laughs> like, didn't always perform great, but man, they built some beautiful robots. That's so hilarious. They, 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 they knew what they were doing, like, building, building. Yeah, I think there was a BattleBots team that some of my friends were involved with, like a high school BattleBot, like 15-pounder. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to say they had, like, Lockheed Martin as a sponsor, so they had, like, this, like, beautiful, like, wire EDM'd weapon. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> yeah. it was, like, pre-hardened S7 tool steel that they wire EDM'd after the fact. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it was it was a killer, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, this Imagineered robot, yeah. it was, like, you know, uh, they... they 
they had it perfectly machined and then they like electroplated it and it was all in the school colors and it was oh, that's hilarious. gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, it's like how much did that cost? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know like with like stuff at Carnegie Mellon what was nice um when I was going to grad school and even as an undergrad at University of Pittsburgh where I'd cross register in CMU classes we would sometimes sneak stuff into NREC powder coating runs or like anno runs or anodization runs for people listening. <coughs> and um, you, it would always be like CMU colors, but we'd get free anodization and powder yeah. coating on our parts. Yeah, um, we had we had a full machine shop like, in our I lab. I think it was at the time they were making Chimp. And so oh, I think, yeah. I think we had a we had an undergrad project that was all the same colors as Chimp now that I'm... I'm now just putting this together in my head. <laughs> what he told me at the time. Why did it end up red? Oh, yeah, exactly. right. <laughs> it, was, it was like red and gray. It was the yeah. exact same colors as Chimp. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, I was guilty of that. We had a full machine shop in the lab, and every now and then it's like, oh, man, I broke something in the house. All right, well, let's go in on a Saturday and, you know, <laughs> fire up the Herco. And <laughs> I did a lot on Bridgeport J-Heads, like... Um, yeah, and then I think we had a um, when I was a freshman at KS Western, we had this pro before I transferred to Pitt. We had this project um, where we were trying to make a uh, like an e lock, but this was in like two thousand eight before like electronic locks were mm -hmm. a thing. And so the way that ours interface to the dorm room door is, you bolted an interface plate on, and um, it got stuck in this position where like. The lock wasn't unlocked, but it also wasn't locked. It just stalled out in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I still remember to this day the maintenance guy coming with a monkey wrench or a pipe wrench and like torquing off the entire lock because we had to call the university cops because we locked ourselves out of our dorm room with that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we we definitely like. <laughs> I, I had a friend who almost locked himself inside the mill at, like, 2 in the morning because, like, you know, he something broke. He was machining, and, like, he he had to get inside to get to the tray and everything, and, like, he didn't disable the door locks. Oh, no. And so, like, fortunately, uh, fortunately, he was able to figure out how to, how to pop it loose. But, like, I was like, yeah, that's, that's probably why they uh, say don't go in there without two people around. Yeah, that's definitely terrifying. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you but, guys had a walk-in mill. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's it was pretty big. It was uh yeah, it was uh um a Herco VM10. Like it's it's like a full vertical machining center. We didn't have the That's fourth well. axis, but yeah, it could do like three foot by three foot by three foot work area. Okay, so we had I think we had like a similar probably smaller than that working envelope on one of our things in the field robotics center at CMU. Yeah, I mean, it's not so like you can walk running. in, but you can yeah. get in. You can, yeah, you're, you're <laughs> sort of slugging through coolant and Yeah, yeah, it's not You got to be wearing like good shoes so a chip doesn't penetrate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and this was the uh, older Bridgeport actually before we got the Herco. So the Herco was super nice cuz it had like the access panel so you didn't have to do all that whereas <laughs> the uh, older Bridgeport was a little a little more constrained. That's wild. Yeah, no, there was, it was pretty great, like, when I, when I first got access to CNC machine tools, and, like, you know, like, there was this Bridgeport Romy that I think was, like, 90s tech that we had in the Carnegie Mellon Field Robotics Center, and just that you could, like, you could tap off on a, a shaft and then tell it, like, what diameter you wanted it turned down <coughs> to, and it would do all the passes for you, so you didn't have to, like, run the axes manually, that, that was amazing, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, ah, no. can I get a beer, and... I mean, I'm not drinking in the shop, but you know what I mean, yeah. <laughs> figuratively. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it was very similar for me. The first first time I learned a machine was uh, was in the MIT machine shop, and they had like they were computer controlled, and like you could set the whole pattern. Oh, that's awesome! And like just it would peck drill everything, and like, oh man, this is so cool. <laughs> And I'm guessing because it's a university, it's still probably like an older tool too. So. Oh yeah, it was like a bridge floppy port. disk or something. <laughs> yeah, it was a bridge port from the '70s or something that they had like bolted on a, a computer to. And you know. we had a similar mod on the one in the FRC. I think there was a USB port on there that was like a crazy complicated thing to add. Yeah, yeah. So, but uh, hey, it worked. Yeah, yeah, I got the job done. A lot, a lot of robots made on those things. I'm sure. Absolutely. You guys had, uh, like, a bunch of water jets, too, right, at MIT. Like, that was one thing that we were always jealous of you for. Yeah, that, that, that all started getting built. Uh, so they built the upgrade to the aero department, like, my 
between my junior and senior year, so cool. I didn't get to use too, too much of that. Yeah, that's oh. fair. I, I may or may not, when I was doing BattleBots, have asked like favors of MIT students to, to run things through that. Yeah, yeah, it, it was it was a pretty pretty sweet uh, pretty sweet gig over there. <laughs> uh, I got spoiled. But yeah, yeah, for sure. Honestly, our, our 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 lab at Virginia Tech was way better than what I had over at MIT, and it was ours, only our lab. Like we'd have people from all over the department being like, "Can we use your stuff?" No. <laughs> <laughs> Get out. <laughs> it's funded by our grants. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. No, nah, I'd occasionally help people out, but yeah, you know, you'd try to be nice. Try to be nice, but you don't want to make a habit of it because you got your own stuff to work on. I, I have a friend at um, NASA who was telling me that like. The people with purchasing cards there will keep a secret that they have a purchasing card. Otherwise, everyone asks them to run stuff through. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll believe it. Yeah, I mean, it's the government. I mean, yeah. You know, like. <clears throat> yeah, I, well, I remember my government travel card. Boy, I was, I was, that was always exciting. Like, are they going to reimburse me in time, or am I going to have to take $6,000 out of my account to pay this off at the end of the month? <laughs> At acquisition school, we heard legend of, like, a C-5 pilot who had to, like, make an emergency landing at some airport in Germany, and, like, he had to basically refill the entire airplane on his government card. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, <laughs> you got you got 30 days to get that paid off, or you're in a whole lot of trouble, buddy. How much does that cost? Oh, God, Lord knows, millions. <laughs> <laughs> Those are... Big airplanes. That's wild. <laughs> I don't know if it was true, but they warned us, you know, it was the story. How did your limit not kick in way before that, though? Like, I would imagine the government cards probably have, like, lower limits Yeah, you that. can call and get it boosted. So, oh, you know, y- you know, it's like... It's like, it, hey, I need fuel for the C5. Right, like, I need to get it to an actual air base, so... Yeah. <clears throat> you know so uh, hey uh jack up that credit limit there pal yeah yeah <laughs> and lord knows if it's true right it was the story they told us uh lieutenants probably. right it was a story they told us lieutenants to like make sure that we uh we were responsible judicious users of the government money and the government's credit yeah it makes sense was that story meant to be anecdotal of like you know here's what we can do if we need to in an emergency or like this guy got himself into a situation that's not good because he didn't go through channels. No, it was more like, look, this is, this is, this is, if you have to do it in an emergency, do it, but understand what you are taking on, right? Like, he was responsible for that money if it didn't get paid off in time. So always fill out your vouchers, always keep your receipts, and. <laughs> okay, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> you know, otherwise. You might end up getting stuck with a multi million dollar. Yeah, you gotta mortgage bill. your house. <laughs> <laughs> And even then, it's not enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. <laughs> yeah. So what are some of the other kind of cool projects you've worked on there, you know, like over the years? Um, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of the work we did on the humanoid was really interesting. And um, uh, I, I, I was tangentially involved in a lot of uh, interesting work. Uh, one of the labs on campus was uh, heavy into 3D printing. And so um, I helped a, a friend of mine out for a senior project. Actually, it was really cool. Um, they built basically a one of those ABB arms, and they put a 3D print head, custom 3D print head, on the end of the ABB arm. Oh, cool. And then they started, like, they built a slicer so that it could do, like, printing like like the little printer pens right like you've got the 3d printer pens yeah, yeah. but except computer controlled so you could like change the direction of the slice midway through huh. so that you can make sure that you have the strongest part of the uh of the uh 3d print in the direction of loading right because the problem is always you have the shear force correct right so if you rotate that 90 degrees in the part where you really want to have the tension right and you go up and down right you get a much stronger piece and you have the the, the different layers and different that sounds directions. really really difficult to program right? oh yeah i don't know i had no <laughs> part of that but i helped them manufacture a few of the components and stuff like that that's and, really yeah, cool yeah so that was that was a really cool project uh that uh that got involved in, and so you know that environment was uh, was a great thing to go back to. But uh, but in the end, uh, going back to commercial products, right? Like you kind of kind of want to see it get get out of the yeah, agreed. Um, and so yeah, that's 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 kind of after Carnegie. That's kind of how I ended up into the driverless cars. 
um, working over at Argo AI. Cool. <coughs> um, and I joined, uh, what, like about a year, year and a half after they, they got started. So enough that I was relatively early, but not one of the initial people there. Yeah. Um, and that was fascinating because, you know, the scale and seeing a company scale was a really new experience as a program manager. So how big were they when you came in versus, I mean, I think so, they were like at 2,000 at the... Yeah, years. at the end yeah. it was like about 2,000 people. I think I was employee like 300, something like that. Oh, cool. <clears throat> yeah, so it was it was a huge That's growth. That's wild. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the things as I kind of went through my career, you know, I started when I went to grad school. Well, my military projects were very, very big, but like subcontractors, right? So I had five different subcontractors, each with their own team of like 70, 50 people, right? But I had no direct supervision or, or, or right? Like I was, I was kind of there to make sure the budget was going and all that. Um, so then I get to grad school and the lab starts off with seven people. And by the time the end of the DRC, we were about 20 people. And I go to Carnegie Robotics, and the team's about 12 people, <clears throat> like the whole team for the whole project. Um, and then I get to Argo. This was on the Nilfus project. Yeah, the Nilfus project. Yeah. And then I get to Argo, and now, whoa, 300 people, like 150 engineers, right? That's got to be some insanity just to try to adapt to that scale. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's, it's something... Um, my, my, my buddy Joe from Virginia Tech, actually, his master's thesis was on this, where... The, the requirements of information transfer as you scale a system require more and more resources, right? And if you undervalue maintaining that oversight and information transfer, your project fails, right? You get too much stove piping or people don't know what they're doing or chaos erupts and there's a tendency you realize something's wrong, and eventually you try to kind of like buy your way out of it. Oh, I'll, I'll hire my way out of it, and it's too late. You've crossed that uh. mythical man month, right? And <laughs> nine women can't make a baby in a month. Yeah, right. So, sense. so, um, so seeing, seeing, you know, I, I had known Joe's thesis, and it was a really fascinating. You know, I'd never thought about things that way, and uh, so going to Argo. It was one of the things that I wanted to try to make sure we avoided and make sure that like good information flow, good understanding of what we were doing and not being overbearing, right? Like that's, you can go too far. You can put too much oversight. Now no one's getting anything done because they're constantly updating their JIRA boards and right, like the government tends to, we want to document everything. We have to know everything. Well, startups want to, I don't want any process, but you can't build a product like that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah and, for sure. And so you have to ride that line of like, how do I get the information to where it needs to go, make sure people know what they're doing, and, uh, and not slow down development. <clears throat> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and... Uh, you know, we were we were pretty successful at it. You know, uh, what are I, some of the mechanisms you use, like to to try to keep <clears throat> information transfer where it should be? So, uh, I mean, one of the one there's a tendency to say, I'm going to roll my own tools, right? Like any sort of program management tool is going to have its flaws. Uh, we use primarily Jira um, by Atlassian, and Jira is good at a lot of things, but it's not perfect, right? Uh, one of the things that I really don't like about it is, and it's gotten a lot better, but at the time, there was no great way for it to interact with Gantt charts. Yeah, I noticed that. Or like <clears throat> setting deadlines and timelines. Right, it's, exactly. It is very it's agile. It's kind of purist. Yeah, yeah, it is pure agile. Yeah. Well, that doesn't work with hardware, right? Hardware has lead times. Anytime you're developing hardware, right? Anytime you're machining a part. Yeah. Anytime right. you're waiting for, there's all sorts of... Uh, What's the word? Dependencies. Dependencies. Yeah, exactly. Somebody needs to work on this over here before you can integrate it right, over there. Right, right. Or like, if you don't get this done in time, you've now blocked all this other work behind you, right? Critical path analysis. That sort of thing that is very, very difficult to visualize in JIRA. Um, yeah. Pure JIRA. Um, so... You know, a lot of what we did was we'd manually kind of lay out the schedules, try to look at long term, um, and then we'd have Jira for like the actual work developers are doing. But uh, a lot of times, you know, you 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 have to. I've got a problem at the moment, 
And again, I want to resist the urge to like, well, everyone go update everything and everything. All right, I build kind of a, here's what I'm doing. And I've just got a punch list of tasks that I need to work through. And just, all right, we're doing a daily sync. And like, I'm going through and I'm making sure that like, did we hit this? Did we hit this? Did we hit this? Did we hit this? Right? Um, and there's some argument to be made that like, well, you could do that in Jira. But yeah, but I got to set up the board and I got to make yeah. sure. It, right, right. Like I spreadsheet, super easy. Right. I just make a list, a couple columns, who's reporting. That's it. Oh, that's cool. <clears throat> right. So you do that for kind of your your fast pace. Like it's changing so often. Everyone can go into the spreadsheet. There's no like learning the UI or learning the interface. You can do that with like a 300 person team. So we did eventually break Google Sheets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the secret is you have to keep any one component that you're doing that with small enough that you don't like have too many people causing it to update and synchronize. That to- makes sense. A lot of times what I'll do with Google Sheets too is I'll have like sprints or like projected sprints like in this axis. <clears throat> Uh, it, I guess rows for people mm-hmm. listening to audio, and then I'll have different functions um, as columns, and then I'll say like what different functions need to do by what you know time scale in order to you know achieve a thing, and I'll half step. But that's closer to a Gantt chart. Yeah, like yeah. Well, well, what Gantt I chart. what I originally set up was actually a little bit uh, a quarterly planning template where like all right, you know, one of the big challenges is. You know, you you go, you get to quarterly planning, and you're like, all right, everyone estimate what we're going to do. And it's like, oh, well, I want to do blah, 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 blah. All right, well, do you have the capacity to do that? (laughs) Like, how do you you actually know? So I built, like, a spreadsheet where it's like, okay, list all the things you want, and then here's the weeks in the quarter, and then, okay, here's how many, here's the people you got, right? And, like, assign, you know, the the full-time engineers per week, one full-time engineer per week whatever and then at the bottom it would add it up and we'll be like you got 10 engineers and you just signed 20 weeks worth of work yeah. in that week it's just yeah. not gonna happen right yeah slide it out yeah it makes a lot of sense um so it, it's it's uh it or bring in resources or bring in resources urgency. depending on urgency yeah yeah and so um you know uh, a lot of a lot of it is again don't let don't let perfect be the enemy of good enough don't let the tool slow you down yeah i think we've all been guilty of that every now and then absolutely but now here's the real thing make sure your leadership knows what's going on right like that's the other aspect of it right reporting up making sure that you know you're you're providing timely actionable information right so there's a real tendency to have engineers you know you ask them to report every week and like what 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 went on and you know they know what they're doing but they'll use super technical language that's super detailed well what's the impact how does that affect like the overall timeline right like so that you can boil that up so that you know you can let the cto ceo know all right you know we've got we've got an issue with our build server we need to expand capacity or you know here's how much you know we're 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 spending on our cloud storage or cloud resources or you know whatever whatever's going on at that time right you have to be able to boil that information up to your executives so that they can take the actions that you aren't going to be able to like go go to Amazon and like okay right like give me the best price you know right <laughs> like there's a team for that and how do you divert their resources to what you need that's interesting so that means going through an executive yeah yeah that yeah. makes a lot of sense yeah cuz you got to prioritize right like okay right like I've got a limited capability for my my uh, my global supply team of what they can do, and you know where I'm, where are they putting their effort? <clears throat> Where's the priority? Um, you know, is is the priority meeting this milestone that we set ourselves, or is it hey we're going out and we're looking for new customers or trying to do some fundraising or 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 um, you know, building a new new vehicle platform, right? Like, there's a lot of stuff that's going on, and the company, as it gets bigger, right, that communication breaks down. Yeah. You know, when I was in grad school and I started off, we all sat in the same room. Everyone knew what everyone was doing because we were in the same room. Yep. Once by the end, there were too many of us to sit in the same room. We were spread out across the building. Well. All right. How do we how do we get regular information? 
by the time Argo, <clears throat> you know, in, in 20, what would it have been, summer of 2020, we had offices in San Francisco, Dearborn, Pittsburgh, Austin, Munich, right? Like, you're now international, right? Yeah. You got to synchronize these people and Across like... time zones. <clears throat> so the information has to flow well. Yeah, like eight hours of time zone. Yeah, that's wild. Mm -hmm. Maybe nine. I can't... Yeah, I think it worked out to... I think it worked out to like nine or nine or ten. Yeah. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah. So. So, again, like, I guess, what are some of the other tricks you use to communicate, sort of like on a day to day? So, the spreadsheet is one thing. That's that's a great way to do it. Um, what are some of the ways that you get like two thousand people sort of marching to the same <coughs> beat? You know, like. Do you have a company wide all hands at that? I mean, that, oh that yeah, sure, sure, expensive. absolutely, yeah. But we we did we did company wide all hands. I mean, Facebook still does company wide all hands, yeah, right? That's true, yeah. Um, you know, part of it was, uh, you know, you have to. So we'd have you know regular planning, you know, with regular cadence, right? You you do have to build some process. A two thousand person company cannot function like a. 50 person startup yeah it's just physically impossible and so again you have to bring in that structure you have to understand what we're doing but here's the other problem you can't stagnate and say well we've been doing it this way forever right stuff will not function as well at certain scales as it does at other scales <laughs> right so my very manual sheet to start like looking at people's loading yeah well the problem is all right, you've got to manually shift everything to like as you get stuff. Yeah. And it's only for one team. That's how those sheets work for me. Too. Right. <clears throat> well, it's only one team. Well, now I got 20 teams. And this slipping on this team affects this other team and it slips out. And like that interconnection can't be manual if it's going to have any value at that point. Yeah. So you have to change your process and you have to find the right tool that will enable what you're actually trying to do. Yeah, it makes right. a lot of sense. And so um, it's a balancing act, but but at a certain point, the process starts to slow you down because it's too manual. What worked at 300 people will not work at 1,000 people. Yeah, and that might not work <coughs> at 2,000 people, and <coughs> projecting into the future, that might not work at 10,000 people. Exactly. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you just have to be dynamic, like the same way you would be in a small company and willing to change and embrace that there's going to be an increased communication overhead in a larger company. It's just how it is. You can't avoid it. And so, you know, what's the way to minimize that as much as possible and be realistic and dynamic about it? it right. Sounds like right. At exactly. a high level, obviously. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, good, good paths of communication so that what are the goals of the company? What are the priorities of the company? People should know that. <clears throat> and then that lets the lower level folks say, okay, I have to make a choice here. Do I do X or Y? Well, our top priority is this. X furthers that. Y does not. Y does not. Okay, great. Do X and report that you're not doing Y. Oh, nice. That's that's what people forget. Yeah. <laughs> right? Cause, okay, well, because, okay, well, someone might have been depending on why. Yeah, and there might be an unforeseen, you know, they might not have the information to realize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And it turns out by delaying why, you've now got three other teams that can't do their jobs <coughs> because there's dependencies there. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, obviously the stuff I do these days is is much smaller scale than that, you know, and so it's just interesting to kind of hear about you know management at that at that scale, and uh, I mean, it's really fascinating, kind of how it it seems like sort of the same, but also kind of different. And so uh, so I'm a big fan, you know. He was an Air Force guy, John Boyd. Yeah. Uh, do you know who he is? I do not. He was a colonel in the Air Force. He was uh, responsible for the development of the F-16 and F-15. Oh, cool. And he invented a concept called the OODA loop. Okay. All right? It I was feel like I've heard this. Yes. It is very observe, yeah. orient, decide, act. Ooda. And so when you're yeah. a fighter pilot, you're constantly in part of your OODA loop. And what you want to do is you want to observe, orient, decide, and act 
before your, your, your enemy does, because by acting before they do, they now have to observe, orient, and respond to you, right? And yeah. so by being inside and faster than your opponent's OODA loop, you win, yeah. because they're constantly readjusting. Otherwise, you're going to get blowed up. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, all right, fine, military thing. But in, in the business world, in the corporate world, the OODA loop is how do you avoid costly mistakes? The faster the information lets you move, decide, and act, there's nothing wrong with going down the wrong path, right? Um, yeah, it's like Zig Ziglar says, fail <clears throat> forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fall forward. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, I, I actually, I'll, I'll never forget, I was working a project when I was in the Air Force. <clears throat> um, it involved GPS, and, like, there was this requirement that, like, you had to be able to, like, pull the GPS receiver out of the box, pop the batteries in, and, like, link up to the satellite super fast. Like, I was like, that's, that's, what, that's, that's, you know really impossible i mean these days it's not but at the time yeah and you know i was talking to the guys actually in the field right because i'm you know the engineer who like you know i basically never touched a gun (laughs) (laughs) Um, and he's like look man i get out of that helicopter and someone's shooting at me i don't have time to sit around for this thing to tell me where to go i'm gonna start moving and figure it out once i'm safe right and that's it you can't let analysis paralysis stop you you gotta move decide, act, and then readjust once you observe the effect of your action, right? And so build that OODA loop and keep it flowing. And if you get stopped, well, then you're then you're in trouble. How do you break that, that blockage? How do you keep yourself moving? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's, that's a great way of looking at it. And, I mean, I, I think you're right. Like, analysis paralysis, I think a lot of it kind of comes from <coughs> just a, a fear of failure or of perception of failure or even a near-term failure not a total failure and 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 and, you know it's not don't analyze just go well no think ahead what are you doing build a plan build a long-term plan absolutely but you bring in those agile principles right i know i want by this point to have you know a humanoid robot right well what are the steps of building a humanoid neurobot well first i gotta you know build the actuators, I got to design the legs, the torso, all, all the upper bodies, work. right? Yeah. Algorithms work. You know the big components, and you can build a sequence, and you can build a long-term plan. You just have to realize that the details, they're going to be constantly changing. And that's where you're like, that's where your OODA loop is, yeah. right? Where like, what's happening right now, maybe a month or two out, but beyond that, I've got broad strokes, and I'm adjusting those broad strokes based on what's happening in the moment, but, you know, I, I, I can't let everything being perfect, I'm going to have all my requirements before I go, and everything's going to be laid out, and I'm going to know all my testing, and I'm just going to do all that, and then it's like, great, three years in, you've got a perfectly defined system, and nothing happens. Yeah, and also, <laughs> like, your principles aren't validated against reality because you haven't built anything. Exactly. Yeah, you got to yeah. test in the environment that you're going to operate in. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. Because you'll learn stuff, and chances are, you know, your initial premises were wrong. Yeah. Integration never goes correctly, no matter 100%. how much we all define our interfaces, and, you know, it's it's... I have never seen something just plug in and work the first time. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> it just it's it's fiction, right? Yep. <laughs> so, uh, so you know, um, it, I think the key to R and D development Some, is adaptability. You know, you know how you achieve that is you you do it when no one's looking. And then you show it to the public. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. Well, no. That, but, right. But even even then, right? Like, right? Like, uh, what, what was it? The uh, the the famous Windows ninety five where it like blue screened while Bill Gates is showing the oh, that's damn hilarious. Thing. I don't remember. That. I think it was something Girl, like I'll that. Pull in a clip of that if you can. <laughs> Yeah, we're like, oh, then there it went. <laughs> the Asimo falling down the stairs. Is yeah, a great one. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Like, yeah. like you know. Um, it, 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 it's 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 never gonna work right the first time. Uh, you gotta build that into your schedule, and you gotta understand that yeah. things that you don't don't expect are gonna go wrong. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I love that when Honda when the Asimo robot fell on the stairs, the first reaction was that people came with a screen and covered it up because they well, were so ashamed. That was one of the glorious things about the DARPA Robotics Challenge. And I'm sad that we haven't done anything else about the DARPA. You're talking about the fail videos. Well, not only that, but like. It forced 
the Japanese teams to get out of their comfort zone. If you looked at the time, the Japanese, everyone's like, they have the most advanced robots around, right? They had Azimo, they had these robots picking up bookcases and moving them around and everything. And it's like, yeah, that's a sterile lab environment. We're going to get it outside. <laughs> There's not going to be any safety tethers, right? Like, it's just going to be debris. And like, you know, uh, we were... There were only four teams that even attempted to walk the course. Like, the way they set it up, um, they had a, a little, like, Polaris that you would drive the first hundred yards. And I was like, oh, driving, that's really hard. Yeah. Yeah, the way they set it up, it wasn't. You just had to, like, hit the accelerator and not swerve, right? It was a straight shot. Oh, I see. So the robot has, like, some kind of control where it holds the wheel relatively straight. Right, exactly. Yeah. Like, there was no, like, dynamic movements or anything. It was basically, like, stay straight. Hit the accelerator. You're not the, reenacting Miami Vice. Right, right. The <laughs> difficult part was getting out of the Polaris, right? Yeah. We actually walked the 100-meter course, and it was sand. Wait, the same course you would have driven with the Polaris? You just yeah. walked it instead? Yeah, because we originally, we never designed. We were a walking lab. That was what we did when the, when the competition was first being defined. We were like, we're just... We're walking. We don't know what terrains they're going to have, but that's what we're going to show. Right, because we didn't have the resources. Sand is challenging even to drive on. Right. Like it, the really, really difficult terra mechanics there. Yeah, yeah. It, and so we were like, you know, this is going to be a really kind of impressive thing. And um, we were the first people to ever do it. Right, like that's, the that's the awesome. Atlas, the Atlas eventually did it. One of the teams had an Atlas with the pre-programmed Boston Dynamics algorithm, uh, but they did it after us. We, we walked it first time. We had the safety gantry up because, again, you know, thesis and not graduating. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we walked it the first time. And, like, it wasn't, like, beach sand. It was pretty hard packed. Oh, okay. But, like, but it was still unstructured terrain. You know, one of the Japanese teams tied it and tried it and they dug right in and they got wallowed and they fell over and all this stuff. Um and so, uh, you know, it, it was great to be like, hey, at the time, I, you know, it's hard to judge with these things, but we might have been the furthest a robot had walked without a safety gantry outdoors. I thought you said you had the safety gantry. The first time we did it. We did it. Oh. We did it. So the first time we did it, it was test day. We kept the safety gantry. That then during sense. the actual competition, uh, the first day we fell over because one of our motor controller cables came unplugged. Ah. Down. Yeah. So we made it halfway there and then the robot fell backwards. That's um, wild. So you just lost motor. Yeah, uh, so yeah. you can actually see in the video, like, the left leg just kicks up and just keeps going up uh, until the robot kind of, you know, falls backwards. Did the right leg try to compensate? Yeah, like, yeah, oh, like, like, it's pretty cool. You see, like, the arms kind of go up like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we made the fail video, right? It was pretty awesome. Yeah, that's I mean, really cool, actually. If you're not like, that's 20 people's livelihoods and <laughs> falling on the floor. <laughs> I get why it's funny, but not when it's you. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's not only is it funny, but it's it's actually pretty impressive that the robot, you know, had the algorithms to compensate with the rest of the system. You know, the when it was suffering a partial failure. Yeah, like the that. controls algorithm. It was amazingly simple. The idea. And yet it produced such lifelike, instinctive behavior. That's interesting. Yeah. Like, it really makes you realize how much of what we do is, like... Outside of our control. Yeah, just, yeah, just instinctual. Our kind of doing yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, so the third day we repaired everything and we walked the whole course and got zero points for it because you only got points for driving. Ah. What we did was harder. So you just did it to show off, basically. Yeah, I mean, we knew, you know, at that point, we you knew... Just, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no, look, at that point, we knew, right, like, we we had much more limited resources than other teams for a variety of reasons. We didn't have, like, professorial support at that point. Um, so it was really just the grad students were yeah. like, we're going to do this. Uh, so we set a goal. We're going to walk the course and if we're lucky, open the door and walk through it. And uh, and so we walked the course, and we got up to the door. And unfortunately, because of the fall the day before, the encoder on the wrist ah. was off. And so it kept pawing at the door, but missing by like an inch because Brutal. the encoder was offset. And your series elastic, and so you're relying on that to know where your yep. hand position is at. I think. Exactly. And okay. so so you know we never we never got to open the door and score our one point. Ah, brutal. <clears throat> what are you going to do? 
Yeah, I mean, walk the course, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, it was a moral victory. Yeah, that's awesome. That's really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So. All right. Well, I feel like we've covered a lot of ground. Um, should we cut it so people still want to listen to this? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, why keep not? Keep going. I could. I could no, talk no, no. This is. I think we have hit a lot. So uh, yeah, yeah, we can do it again. I mean, uh, yeah, we can always do it again. Yeah. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks for coming on, John. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, Spencer. And, uh, thank you so much for having me on. This was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krause is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krause is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.